Okay, um, good evening everybody, um, welcome. My name is Tom Lund. I'm a city councillor here in Lock. It's in my capacity as Deputy Director of the Sheffield Political Economy Research Institute at the University of Sheffield. That I'm welcoming you here this evening. And I'm really delighted to be welcoming so many people. Um, so thanks for coming out. Um, the Political Economy Research Institute, Sperry, is really pleased to be uh, hosting tonight's event with the Resolution Foundation, an organisation that we've been proud to work with over the last um, 11 years since we were founded. And our entire existence as a research institute has been in a decade that has been characterised by low growth, uh, flat wages and low productivity. And reversing those trends is a challenge for all of us and something that will be talking about um, this evening, not just a challenge for the whole of the UK, but a challenge for us particularly here in Sheffield and South Yorkshire. Um, so that's the topic for tonight. Great to see some of you here. And I'm, without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Terry Fox, uh, leader of the City Council, to form and welcome. Thanks everybody for coming tonight. My name is Councillor Terry Fox, I'm the leader of Sheffield City Council and I'm so proud to be a leader of my own city. It is absolutely one of the most uh, rewarding gifts that one gets certainly to introduce about the prosperity of South Yorkshire. Um, I spent 30 years in the pit and so I come from a background of quality long-term jobs and the security and the confidence that that gives you in a world of work cannot be underestimated. But as everybody knows, for one major industry, there, there was decimation. But that does not mean that then we just fall flat on our face. It, it's how we pull ourselves up, how we kind of look forward. And Sheffield being one of the eight core cities is a determined driver of wealth and prosperity. It's certainly in South Yorkshire. And you've got a fantastic guest tonight to, to, to listen to a lot better than what I can put in order. All I can say is from the communities that we represent and from the people and residents of Sheffield, it is a real kind of driver that we want to be part of a very prosperous South Yorkshire. I'm very proud to be within that. And when you look what we're driving on with the AMRC, with Hamid, who would have thought in my lifetime that I would have been talking to the directors of Boeing, McLaren, Rolls-Royce, and those executives, actually by answers of what was Orgreave and what we now call Waverley. So when we see the legacy of the past, but we see the vision of the future, we should all be buying into that. And we should all have that kind of ambition and that appetite to be able to push forward. People talk about the enterprise zones, they talk about investment zones, talk about innovation corridors. What does regeneration actually mean for the people who live and want to go into South Yorkshire? So I have a real desire about skills, about knowledge, but also about our communities and how we all come together to share, to share that prosperity that we can give. So hopefully tonight you'll hear from, from our guests who will all tell us and give us that opportunity to have that input. And certainly within this fantastic, fantastic area of our Nelson Mandela room and our mirror room in this town hall that has seen so many times and so many great achievements in this room alone. So I hope you, you get out what you put in and hopefully a big warm welcome from Sheffield City Council. But I'll hand over to the Thorsten now. So thank you. Thank you very much, Terry. I'm Thorsten Bell, I'm the Chief Executive of the Resolution Foundation. I'm also the gap in the market for white men to introduce this event. The, uh, so I thought I would get going. Three is about as many as you need for every good event I've found for most of the 20th century. So today is not going to be uh, an exception. The, um, now, for those of you who don't know, the Resolution Foundation is an economic research charity focused on raising the living standards of um, households on low and middle incomes. The, um, uh, now, um, in general, if anything is too much economic news around at the moment. You've got a banking crisis, if you're really keen, you've got the budget last week to pay attention to, 
And then there's the big one that we're all living through, which is a cost of living crisis, which is leaving us all feeling as humans. Inflation at 40 year highs. If you looked at the forecast from the government's official forecasters last week, which obviously you're all not sad enough to have done, but had you done that, then you would have seen forecasts for 6% living standards falls, 6% income falls over the course of this year. And next year, that's the biggest on record by far. That's what you only see very, very deep. Um, uh, research recessions, we as an organization work on those things, which keeps us all really perky. The, um, we all live those things because we're all dealing with those economic forces in our lives, in our jobs, and in our um, shops. The goal of today, though, is to step back from that very painful lived experience about what is happening right now and to ask why is the Britain that went into those shocks, that cost of living crisis, so exposed to them? Why do we find it so hard to deal with? All European countries are obviously wrestling with this. We, in many ways, are coming out of it. Uh, worse. How has the Britain got to the situation where that's the case? And then much more importantly, what is the plausible route to a better tomorrow? Because it's really important not just to whinge about the past, not least because you probably can't do much about that. Then, but what's the better tomorrow? And for us that means what's the plausible route to having growth up and inequality down um, in Britain? That is the focus of what's being advertised here, the Economy 2030 inquiry, which is a big, huge research project that we in the London School of Economics have been doing over the course of the last 18 months and over the course of the next year. Um, like 100 research papers, events up and down the country, more spreadsheets than even the keenest of you would ever want to um, see. The, um, and that is about pondering how to be richer, how to be fairer. Now we're understandably focused on the national picture. It's about what a national economic strategy looks like for a country that, if we're honest, is in relative decline. Yeah, and luckily, I think we've kind of woken up to that. There's been quite a lot of denial, but You've got to be basically clinically insane or very optimistic to think that Britain isn't currently in economic decline. We're going to be going into the next few years of wages exactly where they were before the financial crisis. And I was working in the Treasury then with some other people in the room. I thought it was pretty bad then. I definitely didn't think 15 years later wages would be back where they were in 2008. The, um, so the plan, we're working on the national strategy for that, but the lived economy isn't national, it's local. It's about local labour markets, about, it's about uh, regional labour markets and it's about your shops where you consume and lives you lead. So the plan for today is for us to share some research about where that work on the national picture has got us, to ask questions, what does that national picture about a plausible, richer and fairer future, what questions does that pose for South Yorkshire and for Sheffield? How does, how, how, what questions about how they fit into a national picture like that? Um, and then listen to the answers because this project isn't finished, we've got six months more to go. And in the end, you, economic strategies are underpinned by national strategies, but they are local strategies. And, and places without local strategies don't do well. <coughs> I'm not going to start naming them, but there's lots of bits of the UK that have not had that clear sense of how they're going to be prosperous in the years ahead, and that does not end well. You end up like Italy, but you don't get the pizza or the sunshine. <laughs> so that's the plan for today. So to help us feel we've got a great plan. First of all, we're going to hear from uh, Molly Broom, who's an economist at the Resolution Foundation, who's going to give you a very short version of what those 50 research papers have done. There's books lying around for the really keen at the back that do a longer summary, but they take kind of 300 pages rather than 15 slides. So, you know, you've got to make your lifestyle choices about how much you can absorb. Then you're going to hear from uh, Oliver Popart, who you all know, doesn't need much introduction, but is the Mayor of South Yorkshire. Congratulations on your recent elevation. Uh, then you're going to hear from Kate Joseph, Chief Executive of Sheffield's City Council and from Louisa Harrison Hawke, who's the Chief Executive of Sheffield Chamber of Commerce. So you've got one mayor, three chief executives, and one. <laughs> so we're going to start with the best of those. So over to Molly. Thank you, Jason. So yeah, I just have the small job of summarising a 150-page book in the space of 10 minutes. So I'll see how I get on, but there's books at the back and I strongly encourage you to read it because there's lots of good stuff in there. Um, so do you want to next slide? So as Thornton said, the UK finds itself in a period of relative decline, and this has been driven largely by our poor productivity performance. While it's true that productivity growth has slowed in most countries after or around the financial crisis, the UK slowdown has been exceptionally severe. In the 12 years following the crisis, labour productivity grew by only 0.4% per year in the UK, compared to an average of 0.9% among the richest 25 OECD countries. 
And this chart here shows that weak productivity growth has translated into stagnant real wages. And these have been falling again as we've experienced high inflation. Wages are now approximately at the same level as they were before the financial crisis, and that comes at a cost of around £11,000 per worker per year, compared to a world in which pay growth has continued to grow um, on its current, uh, on its pre-financial uh, crisis trend. <coughs> so next slide, please. The UK has been living with flatlining wages for the past 15 years, but it has been living with high inequality for even longer. This chart shows the Gini coefficient for disposable household income, which is a measure of disposable, of disposable income across the population. A lower value means that household incomes are more equally distributed across the population. Here we can see that income inequality has incre increased during the 1980s and it has remained elevated ever since. In fact, the UK has a higher income inequality than any other major European country. High inequality combined with the weak growth that we've seen is a toxic combination, and this is translated into particularly poor outcomes for low to middle income families in Britain. This chart shows how incomes in Britain are the bottom, middle and top compared to other European countries. So looking at France, we can see that the 90th percentile of households in Britain have higher incomes than those in France, and this is shown by the turquoise bar being below zero. Moving to the left, the dark blue bar shows that typical household incomes in Britain are 9% lower than typical household incomes in France. And then finally, the red bar shows that low income households in Britain are 22% poorer than their counterparts in France. And this is equivalent to £3,800 per year. So the story of uh, Low productivity is also important at the local level too. Productivity in South Yorkshire is 20% lower than the national average, shown by this chart on the left. And it is important because productivity is a key driver of pay performance. We can see that places with low productivity generally have low pay too. And this is true for South Yorkshire where the average hourly pay is £16.70, which is 10% lower than the national average. So, what does getting serious about growth mean for Britain and South Yorkshire? To get serious about growth, we need to have clarity about what kind of economy we have. And it's clear from the data that the UK's strengths lie in its broad-based services economy. Services account for around half of UK exports, which is roughly twice the OECD average share. And although it's rarely celebrated, the UK is in fact the second largest exporter of services in the world, behind only the US. And it's not just banking and finance, the UK has comparative advantages across a range of different sectors, including information and communications, cultural and, property and intellectual property services too. But recognising that the UK economy is and will remain a services-led economy does not mean giving up on manufacturing. The UK does have manufacturing strength and strengths to build on, and these are often highly complementary to our services economy. And we should continue to support, support these manufacturing strengths while also looking at to build new ones. We also need to get serious about levelling up our second cities. On this chart here, the bubbles further to the right hand side are <coughs> more productive cities as measured by GBA per worker, and the size of the bubble shows the number of workers in each area. What we can see from this chart is that the UK has a superstar city, which is London, and our second cities generally lie behind. But it doesn't have to be this way. If we look at France, which is quite a good comparator because it's also a services-led economy and it also has a superstar city, which is Paris, we can see that second city, the second cities in France are more productive. And you just need to look at where places like Lyon and Toulouse are on this chart. In fact, Paris is only 26 more productive than Lyon, whereas London is 41% more productive than Manchester. But the good news is that our comparative advantage in, product, in productive um, services offers a route to levelling up our second cities, because high-value services industries tend to thrive when they're co-located co in the same place. Next slide, please. So what does this mean for South Yorkshire? 
This chart shows that the general trend away, uh, there's been a general trend away from manufacturing towards services. And we can see that here in this chart by the turquoise bars getting uh, bigger and the red bars getting smaller. Sheffield has seen the manufacturing decline, but it's also seen strong, uh, strong growth in its public sector. So we'd be keen to hear from people why this is and what might be the direction of travel going forward, as it hasn't seen the strong growth in um, the trade or services sector seen elsewhere. And we'd like to know, um, are people okay with that? <coughs> Next slide, please. So as this slide says here, life and economic is about trade-offs and we need to be honest about those. Firstly, we need to be realistic about the investment needed to close these productivity gaps. This thought experiment shows that reducing the productivity gap between Sheffield and London by 20% will be far from easy or swift. It will, will require increasing total capital per worker by 27.5%, increasing Sheffield's graduate share by 40, from 44% to 57%, and increasing the size of the labour force to 391,000 workers. Secondly, we need to be honest about um, how higher incomes often translate to higher inequality. Um, I don't know whether you can see it very well in this chart, but um, this chart is trying to show that local authorities with higher median incomes also tend to have a large income gap. Um, and this chart is supposed to show that um, some yellow bars, which basically get bigger the further you move to the right, which shows. Um, the inequality increases where the <coughs> incomes are highest. Next slide, please. So, what's the size of the, uh, so where we where should we be aiming to get to, and what is the size of the prize? Next slide. So, in reality, catching up to the US, if the US's productivity levels will be difficult, and we probably aren't going to reduce income inequality to levels seen in Norway anytime soon. But there is a cluster of other countries with incomes that are both higher and more equally distributed than the UK's, which suggests there is a uh, scope for catch up on both of these fronts. Next slide, please. If we, were, um, if we were to close the gap on growth and inequality between the UK and a set of comparative countries defined here as Australia, Canada, France, Germany, and the Netherlands, this would have a huge effect on. Uh, those at the bottom and middle of the income distribution. If we were to raise average disposable incomes by 21% to match this set of comparative economies, while also closing the gap on inequality, this would increase incomes by more than 40% among the poorest fifth of the country. It would also increase incomes by more than 30% for those in the middle, and it wouldn't reduce incomes at the top. In fact, they would also rise slightly. This demonstrates the size of the prize available, without needing to match American levels of productivity or Scandinavian levels of inequality. So in fact, closing the gap on growth and inequality will boost incomes in the middle by £8,800. And again, this demonstrate, demonstrates the size of the price um, if we were to catch up on those countries that were, aren't that di different from us. So this is the final slide for me, um, and I'll just summarise. So low growth and high inequality has been a toxic combination which has been particularly bad for low and middle income families. We need to get serious about turning things around, and the UK services specialism is likely to remain central to natural, na national prosperity and key to levelling up our second cities. But we need to be honest about the scale of investment required and be honest about the challenges that success will bring. So this is what a national strategy might look like, and but local strategies will, will well will need to be different. And we'd like to hear from the rest of the panel to see what where to start your journey from here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I was going to start with a joke, but I'm jolly depressed. <laughs> <laughs> we shouldn't be. Um, thank you, Monica, and thank you, thank you Saucy, um, for being here as well. Um, it's great to have this conversation. I think it's an incredibly important conversation for all of us out here, which is to be having. What I find really important when we have these conversations is thinking about the challenges and the goals, but thinking about the time frame that we face. So, this is a conversation about what we want the economy to look like in 2030. 
When I took office on May the 9th last year, nearly a year ago, it was 400 weeks um, until 2013, which obviously isn't long, but now it's just 354 weeks. And if that still feels like a long time, you might want to remember that it's only 351 weeks ago since 2016, uh, which is obviously when we had the referendum. Um, and so I say that for two reasons. Firstly, 2013, is just right around the corner, much closer than it otherwise might feel. Because I don't know about you, 2016 just feels like it was the other day. Um, a lot has clearly happened, too much has happened, frankly. I think we all bear the scars since June 2016. I was the, um, I was the director for the referendum campaign, the Remain campaign, up here in Yorkshire and the Humber in Lincolnshire, so I certainly bear the scars on my back. Um, but looking forward, the horizon, does feel much more open and cluttered, like we actually can change things from this position that we're in right now. My team write these notes for me and they call this the Hoppard Fancy Horizon Theory, which I'm not <laughs> sure is particularly going to catch on, but I do want to try and pers persevere with it, uh, because I do think it underlines that we need to identify some of the core challenges that things that we are going to fixate on and focus on over the next um, 354 weeks from today. So let me just point to a few of those, which will hopefully get the conversation started. So there are some things that I think are absolutely fundamental if we want to have a bigger and better economy here in South Yorkshire. And um, firstly, we're going to resolve our trade relationship, not just with the EU, but with the rest of the world. So we were just having this conversation uh, backstage earlier about the balance between services and manufacturing. And I was pleased to hear that manufacturing is still part of our future because we, you're right, we need to lean into the service sector. But in South Yorkshire, we also need to build on our advanced manufacturing sector and, and our heritage and our strength. So exports in that area do matter. The OER forecasts a 15% fall in trade when compared to our pre-2016 terms of trade. And we have to, absolutely have to, resolve that issue because no one expects to uh, work 15% less and still earn the same amount of money. And that's a awful one. Um, we will <laughs> restore private investment. I'm saying we will restore private investment and rationalise public investment. So private investment, certainly in South Georgia, has flatlined. It is 16% below where we would have been had we not left the EU, and that absolutely, obviously, can't continue. The same applies to public investment. The endless rounds of competitions, which all too often South Georgia has been on the fuzzy end of, and um, just the other day, like we're not funding South Georgia didn't receive the seven million pounds there. Um, 474 million pounds that we bid for from the BSIP fund, and again, South Georgia didn't receive any money there either. They are they have been dreamt up because they provide a good announcement, but they don't actually help us to level up this country, and we need to fix that. And um, it's one of the great distractions, I think, from resolving real problems. So we need a fair funding formula uh, for South Yorkshire and the rest of the north. Andy Burnham and I have both talked about the farmer formula for the north, and I think that's a, a good idea. Uh, we will have acted decisively on net zero, so retrofitting thousands of homes to save money on bills, provide warmth, reduce our energy consumption, and realise the opportunities for our economy of hitting those net zero goals. All too often we talk about hitting net zero as a challenge, actually it's a huge opportunity too, for places like South Georgia and the virtual circle that it can create. Number five, through devolution, we're going to truly take and back control. Um, I think that is fundamental to me and my role, most of all. Power needs to be aligned with accountability, that's true. I don't want my own uh, South Yorkshire standing army, although some people in the room may do. I don't want to say on how local bus services run with a democratic mandate. Um, the core economic services, transport, housing, skills, the services that affect people's day-to-day -day lives, but particularly the economy, needs to be vested in this region where we are closest to those problems. I think that's ultimately key, not just to fixing the economy, but restoring faith in our politics and our democracy, which I think we all agree has been damaged fairly fundamentally over the last few years. And then finally, and the point I will end on, last but not least, uh, we will have developed in that time, or begun to deliver, a strategy and a vision for South Yorkshire that is forward-looking, optimistic, and has growth at its heart. And I want to leave on that point, growth at its heart. There is no sustainable future for South Yorkshire that isn't significantly wealthier and more united behind that goal. So I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Robert. Well, this is on some growth, we finish on some optimism. It is depressing than the charts. Right, now you're going to get complete.
number two. Thank you very much, folks. Um, I'm also going to try and segue from gloomy, depressing things to optimism because then we know to be no that's how I'm trying to live my life. It's all to see you all and to be here. And thanks to Charleston and Beverly Breslin Foundation for, for coming to Sheffield today. So, um, just before we move on to, um, on to all the grounds that I think there are to be really optimistic about the future for our region and our city and how we might navigate that, that route. I think there is an important point around just re recognising not just, you know, Molly shared some very depressing charts, but actually there's a really human, there's a really important human element to, the, to those numbers. And to kind of take the numbers to a, to a further level of, of, uh, of, you could say it's gloomy, or you could say it's, um, it drives, it creates a driver and a sense of, of mission and importance around why this is so important. We know in this city here in Sheffield, that the inequalities that we see are, are so incredibly stark. The healthy life expectancy in Sheffield is actually one of the highest in the core cities, but what that masks is the difference between the northeast and the southwest of the city of 15 years of healthy life expectancy for women and 14 for, for men um, in this day and age. Food bad use doubled between 2019 to 2020 um, and is now at 91% compared to 41% nationally. Um, and that the, those inequalities are particularly stark for um, black and minoritised ethnic communities in our city. We know, for example, just as an example, that the Pakistani Bangladeshi population has the lowest employment rate in the city and far lower than the national average. And finally, just to add to the kind of human element of this, um, we know also know that where that inactivity is a huge problem nationally, it's a massive drag on our economy, but on, in, in this city, 30% of those inactive in the city are due to long term illnesses. So I think there's just something really important about not being defined by the inequality that is real, but also not being um, naive about how stark and how entrenched it is. But as I said, I do want to try and be positive and to try and flip this conversation a bit, because the question we're being asked is, well, with these challenges, with these incredible um, uh, headwinds, how do we navigate a route to a fairer <coughs> and prosperous uh, future for our region and for our city? And I think, you know, to, to sort of overuse an analogy, if we're talking about navigating a journey, the first thing is we do need to know where we start, and it isn't all gloomy. Um, yes, we know that the private sector is underrepresented in Sheffield, as, as uh, Molly set out, but we also know that there's some globally relevant growth areas. Yes, advanced manufacturing, but also, and also, uh, the low carbon economy, satellite telecommunications, med tech and innovation, applied research around well-being, and digital tech, and let's not forget the creative industries, which are huge in this city and huge in this region. Those are incredible assets to be building from. We have <coughs> amazing academic expertise. I don't think there are many cities at, outside of London that can boast two globally renowned universities with genuinely, genuinely <coughs> complementary strengths. Um, and um, actually, I was expecting all of them to say more about innovation corridors because this is normally talks about that. So I was, I, I was going to gloss over it. But what we know is that we've got the foundations of a really incredible innovation cluster right here in Sheffield and in South Yorkshire. And while business startup rates and high growth businesses are not where they need to be, we also know that our business survival rates are among the highest of all the core cities. And that says something about the tenacity and the creativity and entrepreneurialism that, is in, that I believe is a huge part of our culture here, um, complemented by a really thriving social enterprise and BCF sector. And then finally, like a stat that I think we just don't do anywhere near enough with, we have an incredibly highly qualified population <coughs> in this city. Um, higher uh, numbers of people who are qualified to MVQ level four and above than any, almost any other core city. And the livability, um, livability ratings to all these people that do all of these surveys, that again puts us at the top of the, top of the tree. So there's something about owning the fact that we've got a lot to be sharing about and a lot to be positive about. So if we know that we start in that place, that yes, it's very challenged, but also has incredible strengths, then the next step is to be clear where we're headed. Um, I am not going to stand here and tell you what, uh, what the answer is as to where we're headed, because I think that's part of the problem that we've maybe got into in lots of our places, and indeed nationally. Um, but it is the case that Sheffield hasn't had an overarching city strategy for over a decade. And without that, it's very hard for any of us to any of us, and, and I put the council alongside institutions, voluntary sector, businesses, anyone who cares about the future of our city, to navigate the challenges we're facing. 
So one of the things that we are really putting a lot of effort into, and I'm really proud that the council is doing this, not leading the way, but supporting um, an, an endeavour that is being led from across a number of um, organisations across the city, is, uh, is work on a new set of city goals. And the idea for those goals is that they're a vehicle for collective action, that they're focused on how we reach a place of inclusive, just growth, and they provide an opportunity to articulate that really clear vision for the future of the city and navigate the transitions that we are facing. Because um, I guess my version of the empty, empty future theory, or, whatever, or uh, sorry, what was it again? The empty theory would be that actually we've got a whole set of enormous transitions that we're facing as a globe and a nation and a city and a region, a climate transition, the wellbeing transition, how we transition to a more just and equitable society, how we think about a regenerative economy, all of those things are, you can see them as challenges or you can see them as, as really exciting journeys that we're going to need to go on together. So I think the work we're doing on the city goals um, might seem a little bit bureaucratic, but actually is really, really important and how we do it is as important as what we come up with. So that will give us the ability as a city and I hope that will feed into the work for the region to know where it is that we're aiming for, to think about how we set out a really ambitious future, but that's also realistic and how we understand how we're going to navigate the headwinds we'll face. The process is important and we're doing a lot of work around co-creation. There's uh, our large receptor colleagues are leading fantastically facilitated collaborative conversations in our communities. We're trying to get to places where people are, not just communities of spatial place, but communities of interest and identity. You know, getting out to, to the football matches and talking to people there about what they love about the city and what they want to see going forward. Um, and I will plug our uh, SheffieldCityGoals.uk website where you can go on till the end of April and tell us what you think the future of the city should look like because actually that's one of the key things I think about how we, how we navigate the tra this transition. We need to navigate in a different way. We need to navigate in a way that is less top-down, less controlled and more participative and more engaging and empowering of all of our communities. So to speak to the navigating then, the one thing I will also say, just going back to how we are faced as a, as a, as a council, um, you know, speaking for the council, like all local authorities, we have been absolutely ravaged by austerity. I mean, as some of you know, I spent a lot of my career working in national government, and every time, every chance I get now, when I'm back in Whitehall, I just say, you really have no idea, you have no idea how bad it is, and I think um, it, it's, it is really, really challenging. The room for manoeuvre, the room for space to think is so constrained, and that's not just in local authorities, that's in universities, that's in the health sector. So we've got to think about how we create the capability and the space to do this, and that's about more partnerships, more with uh, like less to, more trusting each other and building trust, more investment in strategic capability and getting out of short-termism, and thinking about how we lead collectively. So we're, we're really hoping and believing and putting a lot of faith in the idea that this work on city goals can be a route to do that. And I would really encourage you to participate in that. Um, and I'm happy in, you know, in talking the conversation about potential, about specific examples, but to give a few, just the work we need to do, for example, on culture in our city, the work we need to do on uh, heritage in our city, the work we need to do on reimagining the city centre, all of those things will be far better if we do them ourselves, not driven top down by what a Whitehall framework says, but driven by what we know about our city and what we know about our strengths. So on that, I hope that is a bit of a positive um, alongside the, the, the gloom. Um, I'm really happy and excited to be talking to you about it later. I'll hand over to me. Thank you very much, Nick. There was definitely some perk in there, <laughs> hidden amongst the gloom. But even more perkiness coming up now. No pressure. <laughs> Hi, good evening. So I thought I'll just introduce myself and just give a little bit of context. Hello. Uh, give a little bit of context to the places in which I operate, which have really kind of shaped my words and thoughts this evening. So as you can see, I am Chief Executive of the Sheffield Chamber of Commerce and Industry. So we're a membership organisation that exists to try and help make Sheffield be the best place to start, run and grow a successful and sustainable business, charity or social enterprise. Um, I do think I have a responsibility as a leader in this city to give back, so I do um, sit on quite a number of boards across the city, which I think shape my perspective and help us <laughs> cross boundaries, cross pollinate, um, and see a broader remit of what goes on in the city. So um, I sit on the board of Southfield Housing Association, uh, Southampton Hospice, 
the Higher Education Partnership, which is a collaboration between the University and Sheffield Hallam about encouraging um, people who might not consider further <coughs> education to go into that. Common um, Purpose UK, which is an international charity which develops leaders that work across public, private, and third sector. I sit on the Lev Board and I chair Sheffield Business Together, which is a partnership with business in the community and Sheffield Chamber, and that brokers private sector resource with third sector need. And in my spare time, I play cricket and grow vegetables. <laughs> but my roles in the region have given me quite a unique insight, really, I think, into the challenges and opportunities. And you asked, what are the prospects for Sheffield and South Yorkshire to rise to the challenge? So often we come at this from a deficit mindset. And what needs fixing? Um, I'd like to try and flip that today, like hey, I'd like to try and stay on the sunny side. So don't get me wrong, I am always asking in the rooms I'm in if things were better, what would be different? Uh, what's stopping that happening now? How can I have a meaningful impact? What can my organisation do? What role can I play? And I'd like to illustrate by talking about four C's so competition, collaboration, co design, and communication. So, from my perspective, competition, as Oliver alluded to, the competitive bidding process that we often find ourselves in is not helpful. I'll give an example, the Great British Railways headquarter unfortunately found out <coughs> that South Yorkshire was not successful. There were 42 cities in that process from the beginning. What a huge amount of wasted time, energy and resource that they all had to put into that. Um, I think, as Paul has said, we need to move to a more guaranteed, long-term funding model that enables more strategic thinking and more deliberate and considered delivery um, we just need a fairer funding formula. Collaboration, I think it's evident to me that in order for us to succeed as a city and as a region, we need that three-legged stool of public, private and third sector collaboration. And that happens in spades already in this city. Um, and I want to illustrate and talk about some of the examples of best practice that I've seen in my time, because I think that uh, we do some great stuff already here in Sheffield. Um, the business response group that was formed during COVID, which had all the anchor institutions, the teaching hospitals, Volume Traction Sheffield, Sheffield Digital, um, the IOD, the CBI, the FSB, all these organisations came together um, and worked to develop an economic recovery plan that the city adopted. The Sheffield City Partnership Board, where we have the anchor institutions, employers, teaching hospitals, DWP, Volume Traction Sheffield, all in the same room. Um, and so much good stuff comes out of that. The Leveling Up Futures and Sheffield project, which is a collaboration with Sheffield City Council, Sheffield Hallam, and Sheffield Chamber, working on the basis that children are 86% less likely to become neat if they have four or more employer engagements. We've got thousands of members in our business community and our asking them to lean in, go into these schools and provide those for employer engagements. In the last year, we've provided over 5,000 engagements in schools into 17 targeted schools across Sheffield, so the schools that needed it the most. Businesses want to help, and if you make the ask easy, you make it easy for them, they're very keen to lean in. Um, I also thought I should mention the Innovation Network, which is the collaboration between both universities, um, because I think that it was formerly the MD Club, but as, as people have talked about, we're so fortunate to have two amazing universities in the city and our business community can better harness that. I mentioned Sheffield Business School, um, not far from here, Hunters Bar School, um, the university, uh, one of the PhD students, um, recognised that there were really high levels of pollution around that school. Um, so working in collaboration, those 70 businesses came together, Henry Boone and um, Arab were really instrumental in that. They built a green fence that can use the right plants to help protect the children from those particles. Um, and Henry Boone committed to doing another two schools a year. Um, and I just think those examples of uh, private sector leading in for the greater good of the city are an abundance in this city. We're founded on the principles of philanthropy, which I always find hard to say. Um, and I think that we should be really proud of that. Um, co design, the third C, co design. So, for far too long, things were done to people and not with people. I've been really proud to be involved in the Economic Recovery Fund that came out of that business response group. And that was um, a real eye opener for me where community groups were encouraged to come forward, and so it was consortiums in district centres to come forward and bid for money um, on an iterative process. So they could come forward and say, I think this is what will increase economic activity in my region, this is what will help footflow in my region. It came from the communities 
and there was a chance to go back forth, back forth, back forth until the project was approved. Um, the, some of the examples that we've seen across the city, all across the city, across all wards of the city, have just been absolutely amazing. And the evidence shows this massively improved economic activity in those district centres because it came from the thoughts and minds of the people in those centres that knew best. Um, a great example for me that I see, um, I talk a lot about you can't change the story if you don't change the storytellers. Um, I'm on the South Yorkshire Housing Board. Two of our trustees are service users or customers. Um, it's the only board I sit on where I see that, and I think it's really wonderful because their insight and their perspective um, is what it's all about. They're not treated in a patronising way, and there's no like saviour complex about it. Treat completely as equals, and they help remind the organisation what they're there for. And I'd like to see that more across the rooms and the boards that I sit in, that the people who the decisions affect the most are in the rooms when those decisions are being made. So finally, communication. So um, I would like more clarity, I think it helps all of us. What is the ask for our region so we can all find the same drum and all the rooms we go? I think there's a real opportunity to crystallise what our USP is in this region, in this region. To be honest, I think there's too much good stuff. I think that's part of our problem. We have so much great stuff, it's difficult to hammer it down. So, despite a decade of austerity and constant changes in personnel and government, uh, we as a region have still produced world class <coughs> examples of excellence, even in a low oxygen environment. So, this region is agile, it's resilient, it's tenacious. We benefit from two world class universities, fabulous colleges. In every city in South Yorkshire, we've got fantastic UTCs. Specials in computing, engineering, creativity, and 40% of the graduates have come to Sheffield stay in Sheffield. As Kate alluded to, Helen is the cleverest ward in the UK. We've got more graduates in Helen than anywhere else. Um, we're the beer capital of Europe, with more breweries here than anywhere else. We're the greenest city in Europe. A third of Sheffield is in the Peak District. I know you all know that, but I would like to repeat it. We're the only city in the world to have an Olympic legacy park that's never had an Olympics. That's pretty cool. <laughs> As Terry mentioned, Boeing Rolls Royce based at the Emirates Manufacturing Park. We've got an advanced lobbying research centre. We've got a national centre of excellence for food engineering that, if you ever get a chance to go to, is fascinating. Using NASA technology to heat liquid and transport it across the room, which is eradicated the need for pipes and water and therefore salmonella. So, anyone that had Kinder Bueno eggs to be called, that won't happen anymore if you use that technology. Uh, they've also developed a rice milling machine, which has reduced rice milling waste from 60% to 1%. The implications of that are tremendous when it comes to world hunger and food quality. We're the EdTech capital of the UK, and I need to give a nod to the Sheffield Technology Parks, where they incubate the tech startups in this region, and Team SY, I can see Laura in the audience, that have done a fantastic programme encouraging female tech entrepreneurs to start businesses and grow and accelerate. There's no reason, it's no surprise though, that Northern Gritstone have announced a fund here because the spin outs from the universities are amazing. And if you ever get a chance to look up a company called Octoram, this is Fisher Price language, but they took bees, they noticed that bees never bang into each other. They took bees, flew them through tunnels, measured their brain activity, took that brain activity, printed it onto chips, and put it into drone technology. Amazing. <laughs> Absolutely amazing. So all the ingredients are here. I think the secret is to keep doing the good stuff, shine a brighter light on it, keep joining the dots, and focus on what we can control. I do have to mention that there's a war for talent. It's not unique to Sheffield, it's all across the UK, and it's not unique to one industry sector. And if we're not careful, we're all going to rob Peter to pay Paul. So I do think that there's an opportunity to close that productivity gap by attracting talent from outside the region and outside the UK to come and live and work here. There's not enough people here to do the jobs we need. So I'd like to see us as a region use the opportunity to encourage a lifelong learning mindset for all our citizens, young and old, and from all walks of life. I think through education and employment, we can genuinely impact social mobility and start to close the gap in the life expectancy that Kate alluded to that varies from 15 years from one side of the city to the other. And I think it's true. Really a lifelong learning mindset that we can be poised and ready to flex and adapt to whatever challenges the next decade might throw at us. Thank you. Not only did you get a perk, you got vegetables, bees, and Kinder Eggs. I did not see all of those coming. The, right now, the last time I was in this room was for a wedding, it was a very good wedding. There's a lot of energy in the room. Okay. 
So that is now a hint, which is there's now going to be as much energy in the room because you're going to ask, not going to dance, don't worry, people are looking stressed, the men are looking stressed. There's not going to be any dancing, there's going to be good questions, and that's going to go our energy levels nearly as high as a high quality wedding. So that is the plan for the next 20 minutes um, or so. So can we have your hands up? And to get us started, the, um, uh, before uh, we do that, I was going to ask Oliver a question to get us started, but think and get your hands up while this is me filling time so you can raise your hands. Like, they, um, why don't you need to? No, I Okay, okay, well, we'll just, I'm not going to ask you a question. You're saved. Okay, let's take we'll the two questions here. Go ahead, sir. Uh, uh, Nick Bosen, a York resident, very glad to be here. Um, one, uh, I think, clear win area, and I'd like to hear more about others. I very much enjoyed the last talk, would be much more collaboration Baltic, Scandinavia, Norway, Finland, and now the Baltic Republics. Uh, right, you want, to, you want to run an SNP kind of pro Scandinavia strategy? You want, you want to twist at all of those. Get a lot of okay. There, a lot of You're going to stretch our Estonian knowledge <laughs> to the Maybe limit. The Very good, Nick. Very good. They, they'll even forgive you from coming down from North Yorkshire. To ask that question. Uh, a gentleman in front of him with a French style poem in honor, of, in honor of the strikes that are taking place across Paris today. Well, you know, we don't need to retire really, so. Hmm. Um, thank you, that was really interesting. Um, so, the budget was up from last week, and the chance to identify five growth areas industry, green industries, digital technologies, life sciences, advanced manufacturing, and creative industry. Uh, I saw lots of that was mentioned today. I wondered if we had to pick one, which do you think Sheffield has the most advantages and strengths of it? Great question. And the gentleman, we've got to go on the right hand side as well. So, do you have a question, sir? Uh, yes, Martin Yarnett. My question is about investment. Um, apart from the possibility of a change of government, what can we do in Sheffield and South Yorkshire to increase private and public investment? That's a great question. Right, let's dole those out. So we've got another microphone um, here. Well, I think it's a bit unfair, Nick, to ask people to have strong views on Lithuania, although I care a lot about Lithuania. There, but Oliver, let's, let's turn it into a slightly broader question. Estonia oh. is in the last 20 years. Good, good Estonia. Which is right there, economic strategy. Nick. Right, so here's a different way of putting it, which is how about, do, do, what about just exporting generally? <laughs> But what about Sheffield and South Yorkshire's links to the global economy in general? How much is when you think when you're thinking about what the economic strategy is for South Yorkshire? How much is it about the world, and how much is it about you know just Barnsley? Uh, <laughs> and they are not mutually exclusive. I, it, is, it absolutely is about a global strategy for trade when it comes to South Yorkshire. We've been having these conversations internally actually just very recently, and. Um, and I think what we know is that we haven't had an effective strategy for growth when it comes to either um, working within the city region or externally when it comes to working internationally. And we need to, we should, and it's been made immeasurably harder, there is absolutely no doubt, over the last few years, given the turmoil when it's come to um, international trade in this country, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't be trying. So um, we, we will be working on that strategy and making sure that we are able to work with partners, particularly in the US particularly in Europe. Um, I think there are some disputes about where we should go, but my view is um, certainly our closest trading partners are right next door and we should be working with them as much as possible, no matter what the kind of uh, the political nature of the discussion around Brexit or, or Remain. Um, and then working with the US because there's lots of potential avenues there um, for us to explore. But it does go to Martin's question as well, actually, which I think is about making sure that there are opportunities for growth and, and you asked the question about how do we do that? What's the thing that makes the difference? Um, there's a bunch of things, and we could all have our own small version of you know, the pet projects around skills or, or um, working on a talent pipeline in terms of businesses. But for me, it's about telling a better story. So actually, what we haven't done very well in this region, I think for all too long, is have a narrative or a story which defines what South Yorkshire is or for. Um, we used to have one of those, and it revolved mainly around the industries of coal and steel. And since that point, we've lost it. And we've lost our confidence alongside it. And actually what we need to do most of all is get our confidence back and be able to go to Estonia or, or Latvia or, or, or Lithuania or, or Pittsburgh and talk to them about the great things that happen here in South Yorkshire and then sell ourselves on that basis. And until and unless, as I said last remark, until and unless we have that narrative and that story and a unified version of that that we go out and sell to the world, we're never going to get anywhere. 
Very good. Right now, Louise, you're going to take the question on. There's lots of priorities. What's your top one? Because a tragedy doesn't exist unless there's some prioritisation. Okay. And um, this is a real cop out. No, come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. So, because in all honesty, in 2008, one of the reasons that this region didn't would fare better than some of the other cities and some of the other core cities is because we were spread across so many different industry sectors. I actually think it's really dangerous to put all your eggs in one basket, and I think. Advanced manufacturing, there's no doubt about it, we're known for that in this region. There's things we do in this region that can't be done anywhere else in the UK, can't be done anywhere else in the world. And the Made in Sheffield badge goes back, what, 400 years? You know, and it's still a world renowned brand, and we're really proud of that. You know, it's still, you still have to apply to use that as a, a license holder today. Um, so the challenges in the advanced manufacturing sector and engineering are really around skills because. Um, there's a lot of people, in, aging people in the workforce that have got the skills and we had about a 20 year gap and we had no sort of uh, YTS schemes or apprenticeships. So there's a lot of young people have gone into it but they've got a massive gap in the middle and in about five years that sector is going to hit a massive problem. So in order to make sure we shore ourselves up for that sector we need a rapid upskilling of, um, of people to go into it. Um, in terms of the green economy, that's really future proofing isn't it? If, we, if we're serious about social mobility and we start to talk to kids about jobs that will be there for life the challenge is how do you upskill people or train people into jobs that don't exist yet that's really hard but we've got world leading um, itm power based in this region and um i forget the name it's just come to doncaster oliver you'll probably remember Hybrid air vehicles. Hybrid air vehicles. You know, we're starting to become a cluster um, for the hydrogen space, and that's fantastic. There's going to be a huge amount of opportunity in that region. I think health and sciences have got a huge focus on children and young people in this region, and because of the work of Sheffield Hallam and at the Advanced Wellbeing Research Centre, and all the stuff down at the OLP, we're perfectly poised for that. Um, the creative sector. You can't have another one. I am, I'm doing yeah. all of them. Um, um, well, I think the thing about the creatives, the creative and the cultural industries, I don't think they get enough of a shout out in this region, if I'm honest. And they're going to get it tonight. They are. <laughs> Not just because they're major employers, but they're a real, they're, that's a real jewel in the crown in terms of attracting people to come live and work here and stay here. Um, and then my final one. What? Yeah, digital. Digital is one of our leading. People keep talking about immersion. It's immersion. It's been around for 10, 15 years. We've been asleep at the wheel. It's one of our absolute trailblazers, digital. We've got Twinkle, Razor, amazing, world renowned, Zoo Digital, world renowned, and Sumo, yes, thank you, Kay. World renowned names and brands out of Sheffield. So, I'm very good. To... That was a very good perky list and a total cop out yeah. on the question. I'm going to turn it around on you guys then. We're going to, we're going to, we're going to go to you for Martin's question, second like investment. But let's do a question for you guys. So, from the outside, the question was like, what's the one, like, if there's going to be a focus, what is the focus? Okay, so you guys are to answer what it should be. But from the outside, I'm just looking at those questions. I'm coming to the cultural types in a second. I can tell from the number of buttons I've got. Uh, right, that isn't the question. I've got a question for you guys. From the outside, it does look like there is an economic strategy, right? The economic strategy is, with, is to talk about advanced manufacturing, which is a small and shrinking part of the economy. And the actual, and now, but we're here to be controversial, okay, right? Because I want some energy in the room. So, <laughs> the, um, you can't have everything. It looks like it's to talk about advanced manufacturing. And put your hand up in this room if you work in advanced manufacturing. Nope, and that is true for the country uh, as a whole. Now, what is the actual economic strategy in Sheffield? What does it look like? The public sector. The NHS and universities, every single speaker you just heard from that panel said that Sheffield's main success is. Uh, is the university. Put your hand up if you do work or have worked for the public sector in Sheffield. Yep. <laughs> public sector, me too. The, um, also, insofar as to be a bit controversial, now here's the question for you guys to, to vote on. Is it a good thing that Sheffield has really strong public sector? I don't mean the overall public sector, I mean the bits that you're talking about in economic strategy terms. So I basically mean the universities and hospitals, that they're really big compared to the size of the economy. And that's a good thing because you can spin off from them, people can get good jobs and they can buy that house in Sheffield Hallam. They're, or is it a bad thing because it distracts you from getting any growth in the private sector? So hands up for it's a really good thing. You're not, you can't go half and half. Hand, okay, hands up if it's a bad thing. So it's a good thing, basically. Okay, good thing, right. You, it's not fair to make you answer that question. So, uh, cause you've, got to say, you've got to say it's a good thing due to being in the public sector. But what about on Martin's question on getting some investment? Oh, is it my, it's my phone, sorry. Um, I do think it's a good thing, by the way. Okay. I will answer that question. But I think that it's, 
I think it's only a good thing if we if we are open about how you harness the connection between the public and private sector. So, um, and if we really capitalise on the strength of the public sector that we have in the city, whether it's universities and hospitals, the civil service, as a former civil servant, we don't do anything about the fact that we've got huge numbers of policy professionals in the city, design policy around skills, around worklessness, around pensions, around, and we do nothing with that. And so I think, not necessarily a bad thing, but only a good thing if we if we do it well. Uh, on private investment, um, yes, to absolutely agree with all this point around, around the narrative. Um, you know, I, I didn't do my my life by when I stood up, but you know, if you think if you think Sheffield's about it, talking ourselves up, try Brandon and Donny. Um, <laughs> uh, it is it is a real problem the way we talk about and think about ourselves in this region, and that's and it's it's the, it's the classic thing, you know, great strengths overplayed. We're humble. We, you know, we're kind, we're compassionate, we're easy, you know, it's easy to meet people, but we're also, you know, you can't show off, you can't, mm, you can't say that. And I think we've got to get better at telling that story because actually when you're talking about people with money to invest in a place, they will, they don't just buy the they don't just buy the thing, they buy the idea, they buy the vision, they buy the, the, the dream, and we've got to start being okay about talking about that. There is a practical point though, which is that we've got to have substance behind it. And so I was, I was talking to somebody in London earlier this week about uh, who's, who's intending on writing a book called Governing is Boring, um, <laughs> which uh, I wasn't sure of the title, but, but the point is very true, which is there's a lot of really boring basic stuff we need to do that we haven't done. So we haven't had things like a really strong infrastructure strategy, a strong energy strategy for the region. We haven't had the basics, the underpinnings that mean that once we get past this, the door with our visionary story, it doesn't fall apart. So alongside the story, we've got to do the basics. We've got to get a pipeline of investment propositions. We've got to get the, um, the, you know, all of those underpinning strategies in place. And then I do think <clears throat> there's a ton of interest from, uh, from, from the private sector, from pension schemes, from patient capital, from other countries. This is an exciting place with potential. We just need to get those things connected together. Great. Right, let's take some more questions. They can be from the back if I can't see you uh, properly. So as a gentleman with the unbuttoned shirts, go ahead first. <laughs> Hi, hi, uh, Tom, the chief executive of Sheffield Theatres. I told you, we're all stereotypes, but just different ones. And that's fine, that's fine, that's just being human, mate. Right, go ahead. You got me, I do want to help the panel uh, prioritise, unsurprisingly, and put the creative sector first. Um, uh, just right now, at the moment, uh, a new musical's been made called Standing the Sky's Edge. <laughs> uh, it's, played to, uh, it's played to tens of thousands of people in London. And uh, it's the most nominated show at the Olivia Awards. And this is all a short way of saying, on the other side of Jude Square, we're making better theatre than we're making in the South East. Yeah. And so if there's one thing Sheffield can definitely shout about, and South Yorkshire can shout about, it's the cultural sector. Yeah. So, Good plug. Yeah. And there's a gentleman in a black rolling neck, even more French. <laughs> Stand up, sex, they can all hear you. Stand up. Stand up. With excellent glasses, Carl. Yeah, well. <laughs> um, um, I'm a member of the Anti Growth Coalition, okay? So this trust thought we made up, we already existed. And so I'm, I'm interested in when all this is growth, and I'm assuming he's meaning this is a new kind of growth, not the old kind of growth, not the kind of growth that just makes rich people richer and poor people poorer. And, you know, it's been touched on, but I, I kind of like to hear a bit more about how we take opportunities in the net zero economy. Anyone else want to come in? <laughs> but, yeah, and there's a lady here. Um, yeah, so I thought it was good for health was a leader to see if we could cast a separate health. Can you answer to stand up? Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Um, so it's good that health was a leader to in this because you can't separate health and wealth. Um, but I think a big thing that maybe wasn't touched upon as much is how do we ensure that jobs are good jobs because mm -hmm. it's not all jobs benefit um, <clears> health. <throat> I also think um, that this this room is not really reflective of Sheffield in its diversity or South Yorkshire. Um, and I think it's important that when we have these conversations, we kind of maybe focus on that more as well. Very good. And there's a gentleman right at the back. Hi, uh, I'm Tom. Um, I'm here as a resident of the so work mainly in the public sector as well. Just following on from these two points, I'm just interested thoughts and how we measure stuff, basically. Uh, we spoke a lot about GDP. Uh, some would argue it's a creepy old, outdated measure. Um, and how that complements other measures and stuff. So how do we do this positively measure in uh, uh, multiple ways that means 
Great, okay, there's a big set of questions there. The creative one was not a question, <laughs> but was still excellent. Yeah, so, uh, Oliver, why don't you take Carl first? Is the anti-growth coalition, are you with him or not? No, I'm, I'm resolutely against Carl and his anti-growth anti um, anti agenda. But before I say that, let me just say I was uh, standing in the sky's edge last night at the National, and it was the best thing I think I've ever seen at the theatre. Absolutely incredible. And uh, if you haven't seen it, I think the run is kind of just for the next few days. I think I'm right to beg for to steal a ticket um, because it's absolutely brilliant. Um, and a great representation of our communities as well, I should say. So on the on the growth point, look, I think there is an issue, isn't there, with how we think about growth in this country. And it goes to the question of the bathroom song as well, because we don't necessarily need to just think about this in terms of GDP, and that's the way we've always thought about this. This is about what is the well-being of our communities, and those two things for me are not uh, mutually exclusive in any way, shape, or form. In fact, actually, I think we need to think about them as much more closely alike, because the thing that's really terrible for your health and your well-being is not having a job. That's the thing that's particularly terrible for you. And when you talk, Carl, about the net zero agenda, I think that's absolutely right. That's the point I was trying to make uh, from the lectern, which was there is a huge opportunity here called net zero. And it is the opportunity to create a huge number of new jobs, new industries, to retrofit every home in this region, to be able to create new products that we can sell to the rest of the world and services that go alongside it. And if we get that right, there is absolutely no reason in the world why the people in this region can't access the benefits that come with that net zero transition. We can absolutely get that right. I'm going to ITM Power tomorrow, the biggest hydrogen electrolyzer factory in the world. We have Forge Masters here in this region who are the only place that can produce nuclear facilities that will power this world as well. So look, we have all the opportunities here in the region. We just need to train the people in this region to take those opportunities, and that's what we've been particularly bad at. So I think we can do both. We can have growth and we can have people, uh, and we can have an inclusive growth model. We don't need to go down the road of venture capital and getting a load of more rich people into this region. I don't think that's what we need, and I don't think that's the route we should go down. Uh, very good. The, um, right now, um, why don't you take the good jobs, are the jobs being created good jobs? Why not? Can we have them, please? Yeah. Oh, can we have Thank you. Um, yeah, no, I absolutely take that point. Uh, I spend a lot of time in my role at the Chamber trying to help encourage employers to be responsible employers. Um, so, looking at things like uh, business in the community is responsible business charter. Um, and encouraging people to um, create environments that are psychologically safe, that provide um, upskilling and learning and work life balance and all of those things. I think ultimately it probably comes down to choice and people being aware of what options are. I remember years ago I did a big piece of research um, and we were reaching out to people to try and speak to them about certain careers. And some of the aspirations, it was really challenging for me to hear when people were saying, oh, it's fine, I'm just going to go and get a job in a warehouse, because that was all they thought they were kind of capable of. And I've seen a big step change in that, actually. So programmes like See It, Be It, that um, have like role modelled, used people to talk about what their career path has been. Um, and like the Level Up Futures project, by taking employees in and talking to them about what options there are, so that, yes, some of it's about raising aspirations, but actually, for some people, the aspiration is there, but they don't have the social capital to get them in the door. And I think that that's something that we need to be really conscious of in this city. And that's why we targeted our stuff into schools that didn't have the social capital, didn't have aunties and uncles that could get you a, a job or an interview at a certain place. Um, I do think, on the whole, quite lucky in this region that there are a lot of really socially responsible employers. So the choice is there, we can choose good employers. You know, we've got some amazing employee ownerships here who really do take care of their people. Um, so I think compared to probably other cities, we're, we're, we're not too bad in terms of having good responsible places to go. Yeah, sorry, Tom. Great right there, you're so consistently perky. We're on brand, <laughs> on message. Right, Molly, do you want to come in on this good jobs question? And I want to come to, uh, we should do the, I'll briefly do your measure it question. That's the economics techie, that's all I'm here for. Um, and then we're going to do one last set of questions and then everyone's going to get on with their lives. Um, yeah, so we've spoken a lot about whether it should be advanced manufacturing or whether it should be public sector, but we need to remember that there's lots of uh, non-tradable services as well. Um, and this strategy, this national strategy, is sort of looking at um, how we can get people to move from the non-tradable sector into more productive sectors and whether we can do that through things like transport, improving um, education, on-the-job training, um, but for those that can't move from 
non-tradable um, sectors, we need to ensure that those jobs are good jobs and we can do that by um, improving uh, conditions. So there's um, a stat in Stagnation Nation where half of um, shift workers get less than one week's notice of their shift patterns and that's something we can definitely improve on so improve the quality of those jobs and also improve the pay of those jobs so whether that be sort of more widely um, adopting sort of international living wage just to like slightly counter the perk <laughs> sheffield has got a lot of low paid jobs mm. a lot due to being the low paid capital of the country so you can sort that out as well. Now, not, everyone, not all the white people in the room. Mm -hmm. Luckily, there are many rooms that came to bed with um, you. I think it's a really important point, and um, you could make a kind of good remark about the fact that, you know, who wants to come to a session with Torsten on the future of the UK? <laughs> um, or, um, or me. Um, but I think actually it's, it's one of the things, that's, when we think about how do we want to navigate these next transitions, are really important. The how matters an awful lot, and the how is about how do we get our, how do we get into spaces where we're having different sorts of conversations and how do we have this conversation in a way that's accessible and interesting and engaging for a very diverse range of, um, of communities? We, we, we know we've got, I think, to be honest, I think all, all, all cities are grappling with this. One of the things we have um, as a city, which I think is a real asset, although it's hard, is um, a thing like the Race Equality Commission, where we've actually gone out and listened and had a very, very... Um, very challenging and hard uh, sort of mirror held up to us around how we how we operate, um, and that is about culture change and it's about asking you know get it really working, getting different people in the room. So um, it is something. Jenny, I'm going to plug it again. It's something we're really trying to do with the city goals work. Where I say we because it's not we, it's not the council. It's a it's a kind of coalition of of anybody who's interested. But it's about saying actually what's the conversation that needs to happen in. And at the Broom Hall Centre near where I live, with uh, members from the from the community, that is a different conversation. That's actually going to elicit something useful um, for the future of the city. So, agree, spot on. Great. Right, okay. Now, just uh, just very briefly, to join your question, sir, at the back with the Anti Growth Coalition glasses over here. Okay, which is. It's just a gentle nudge. So obviously there's lots of problems with GDP. I'm not going to go into how we measure GDP, right? There's loads of technical issues about whether how great it is. So I was going to give you two just facts to ponder before you totally throw whatever the baby in the bathwater analogy is here, right? Which is, firstly, why haven't wages grown in Britain over the last 15 years? It's, it's, it's because Britain hasn't grown in GDP terms, right? That is why. So when you hear people, I regularly hear people saying to me, oh, GDP, you know, it's not my GDP, it's completely disconnected from ordinary working people, okay, right? There are times when that can be true for a bit of time in a given year, but it is bullshit about Britain in the last 15 years. The lack of growth is why wages have not grown. And so when you say you're in the anti-growth coalition, just be absolutely clear, you mean you're in the anti-wage rises for workers up and down the country coalition. And so be, much better is to be an anti-rubbish growth, right? I'm anti-green anti growth, I'm anti-sustainability anti growth, I'm anti-growth for the rich. Those are the good coalitions to be in. But if you are anti-growth, you are pro the wage stagnation of the last 15 years, which has seen the poorest people in this country going from spending 50% of their income on essential to spending 60% before a cost of living crisis turns up. And that is why they're at a food bank, right? So just, you know, write all the articles you want about why GDP is a crap measure, but those wages have got to go up for working people, and you are not going to do that without growth. Yeah, that's very popular, I can tell. Right, <laughs> last set of questions. There's a gentleman here with a moustache combination going on. Go ahead, sir. That's you. <laughs> Great, that's some, that's some good boldness. Like Is that a lady here? <laughs> What specifically we can do about that? Uh, and, and especially 
Christian and the gentleman here. And then I'll have the lady over here and then we'll wrap up. That's you. Oh, go, go. Hi, I'm Dan Turner. Um, I think I want to just challenge the panel because... We don't want that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so if we already have all these great assets, if the service economy is going to be the future, or if that's when that comes into the future, and we've tried the service economy in you know, the 1990s and 2000s, that was a big push. We tried advanced manufacturing here in the gates. What's going to be different this time to make it work? Very good. Uh, Dan, there's a lady over here to wrap us up. She's finished her wine, so it must be bad. Um, Great question. The wine has done its job. Well, right. oh, the storytelling. Can we have some forward looking, not just some, it's all great what we've got? Can I, can I just quickly reflect on your point about GDP and the fact that we need more growth? Because I just want to tell a very quick story about um, why for me, I'm not part of the anti growth coalition, why growth for me is so important. So when I was campaigning to be mayor, I went to the Essex Food Bank. I don't know if you know the Essex Food Bank, but it's in Walkley and Tom Hunt's ward. Um, there's a guy called Chris that runs the Essex Food Bank. Chris um, is a brilliant bloke. Uh, he used to run the food bank when it was up in a church, St Thomas's Church. It was the back room of the church when I was running for Parliament in 2015. When I went to see it last year, so 2022, just seven years later, we've been locked in. That is the <laughs> least subtle hint. <laughs> At the wedding, that didn't happen. <laughs> Um, when I went back to the Essex Food Bank last year, so seven years later, it's in a warehouse. And I was talking to Chris about what was going on at the, the food bank, and he told me that not so long ago, um, there'd been a boy who'd been brought to the food bank on his sixth birthday, and he'd been brought there because um, it was the closest that his parents would get to a day now. That's why they took him to the food bank. He was six years old. Now, you know, we can all have our kind of ideas about how to grow a more equal economy and all the rest of it, and, and, and big ideas about economic growth. But fundamentally, as I said in the presentation, this is about people, and mainly it's about poor people in our region not having enough money, not having enough money to feed their kids, do something nice for them on their birthdays, turn the lights on, turn the heat on. And if we're not here to fix that problem, we're not here to do anything. So ultimately, that's why I think about growth, because that kid needs our help. And there's all too many kids like that in our region. We think there's probably 14,000, 15,000 families in our region that have a child who goes to sleep at night who isn't safe in some way, shape, or form, be it mold in their bedroom or domestic abuse in their household. 15,000 families in our region. That just isn't okay. And we need to fix that. And if we don't fix it, nobody else will. So that's what we're doing. In terms of the story that we need to tell, yeah, of course we could be potentially the greatest innovation story the world's ever seen, and we could be that here in South Yorkshire. And if we get it right, we will be, because we've got all the assets to make that a reality. We can we can compete with anywhere in, in the world, frankly, if we get it right, because I've got absolutely no doubt that the people here in this region are just as clever as people elsewhere. We've got two world-class universities. If we get that right, we can get there. I'm actually more interested in the story that we tell ourselves. Because the only people, like I say, who can fix this are here in this region. And that starts with us, us having that confidence to tell ourselves that we can go and do it. So actually, until and unless we tell ourselves a better story, that story that actually we were once world leading, we started the Industrial Revolution in lots of different ways. We can do that again. We're on the cusp of huge changes globally. And South Yorkshire can be at the forefront of those changes. But we need to tell ourselves a better story. And we need to do that first and foremost. Very good. It's the internal communications. Uh, uh, challenge. Right, let's do, you're going, to, you're going to do health and reporting, what we're going to do to get it down and net zero. And then, and then Louise, I'm going to come to, and I'm going to, come to you on um, uh, Dan's tough question to finish on, which is why is this, you're already perky, you have been very perky, you're the winner. Why is the future going to be different to the less successful boss? Um, so, was it, was it Amy, sorry? Yeah. yeah, so I think um, the main, the answer, I, the first answer I'd give, which is the sort of realistic answer, is that the local authority on its own can't, can't tackle this. This is a huge, huge challenge. 
but actually um, the first step is to say is this the thing we want to fix is this the thing we want to fix in our city do we want to be a city that is fairer do we want to be a city where this, this entrenched inequality continues and if the answer to that is yes we want to fix it no we don't want it to continue then we need to start putting all of our resources all of our energy and strategy in that direction and that links back to Oliver's point which is that the work we do on uh, our economic strategies the work we do on our um, uh, where our innovation goes I mean if you go if you think about some of the stuff that ha is happening at Hallam in the Advanced Wellbeing Research Centre in what will be the Child Health Technology Centre those innovations can connect to our communities and, and make things better so I would say the first thing is to decide, you know, is to really prioritise and to put all our resources in that place. And then um, potentially links to the point around the public sector, like we use our assets in the public sector in these spaces. Um, also, we need to engage back to the earlier point with those communities and, and on both sides and make this, make this a sort of shared endeavour, which it doesn't feel like. I often feel like moving to Sheffield. Um, reminded me a bit of living in Washington DC where it's incredibly economically stratified, you know, you live in a neighbourhood and uh, literally two miles away is the, the kind of murder capital of the US and you never see it um, because it's so stratified and I think we can do something about that in terms of how we how we build the future of the city. And then on the net zero point, um, you're right, there's lots of ambition and it comes back to my earlier point around governing is boring. It's not good enough to just have a big ambition and a big goal and we've also then got to sit, it, sit underneath it a whole set of actions and capabilities. And when I arrived in the council, there was a tiny team working on sustainability um, because we hadn't put the resource behind the, uh, the ambition. We have now done that. We've got a 10 point plan that we're, we're prioritising and we're getting on with doing, getting our own house in order. It will take time, but I think one of the things we've got to be really open and honest about is, is trying to do everything all at once gets you nowhere. We need to be sequenced, we need to focus on um, uh, the actions we can take as a council, the actions we can support businesses to take, the actions we can support households to take. And we need to learn from other places like Bristol that are moving faster than us. And, uh, you know, Marvin uh, Reese, the mayor of Bristol, will say they spent £6 million in four years working out how to do it. We don't need to spend £6 million in four years because they've done it. So let's just learn from them and get on. Over to you. Okay. I'll try to be thank you. <laughs> um, you so can do it per Okay, I'll try. So um, I can only speak in my experience. So I've lived in West Sheffield for the last 20 years. And I think what feels different now is the leadership is the leadership um, in the local authority, in case we a breath of fresh air. We've finally got a mayor that's actually got some devolved powers, hooray, you know? And so I think actually having people that see the benefit of inclusive economic growth and genuinely collaborate across the region is gonna make a massive step change. I think the thing we need to do differently is disagree in private. So what we didn't do well in the past was people fell out in public and we were not considered a safe pair of hands in this region for anything. So I think that's going to be the biggest step changes. I think um, genuinely everybody is really collegiate and does want to collaborate. And I think that was a great you know, front foot forward and shows us as a region to be somewhere that is you know, on the up. Very good. She was no QC. Told you. Right, uh, despite appearances, this isn't actually a hostage situation. Uh, so we are actually going to uh, wrap up before like some other doom descends and we're all like, in some hemmed in nightmare. Because it's been fun, Escape guys, room. but I don't want to spend the rest of my life in here. So, uh, can we say thank you very much to the panel for their talk today? Thank you. Thank that you have like choices about how you spend your lives. I think you made a good choice. You'll have to evaluate that afterwards. This is free, so there's no market mechanism anyway for you to uh, <laughs> respond to that. But Britain needs a new strategy. Sheffield and South Yorkshire definitely needs a new strategy. The, um, um, these kind of conversations and many more with many other different audiences are part of that. But then we need to do it as well as talk about it. So off you go. Go and build a better future. Have a good day, everyone.